I like to think of AI as a camera for the imagination. So you can um, create work with it strictly AI. You can use it as reference. You can use it as a base and paint on top of it. And some of the most fascinating work is that that has a mixed media approach that way. As it develops, we're going to have video. We're going to have audio. We're going to have all kinds of options for creatives to integrate it into their workflow as much or as little as they want. Um, I think we're going to have a movement that values pure AI, so to speak. We're going to have one that values mixed media, and we're going to have one that swings back strictly towards the traditional. Whatever movement you resonate with, there'll be one for you. Alejandro, how we doing, man? Que tal, Matt? Thank you so much for having me back after a long-winded absence. Um, I'm excited for the podcast. Who do we have on today? We are always happy to have you, Ale. I know you're busy out there, but we love having you on the pod. Well, very excited about today's guest, Claire Silver, one of the leading AI artists in the NFT space. She's a collaborative artist who combines AI elements like GANs, uh, Art Breeder, with uh, traditional elements like oil, acrylic, collage, photography, uh, for really stunning works. And she has found some real success in the NFT space. Um, her super rare Genesis piece sold for more than 52 ETH, uh, $92,000 at the time. And she has emerged as a very important voice for AI art at a time when powerful tools like Dolly 2 and Midjourney are becoming more accessible to the public at large. Uh, so very excited to hear her take on what has become a hot topic in the space. Ale, what are you excited about? Man, you, you spit it on so, so articulately. I think these new tools of democratization are going to create open up the floodgates. So I'm actually interested to hear... Uh, her thoughts on the role of curation um, in in this in the capacity. I definitely want to speak to her around what does the human element mean in the age of AI and what does identity really speak to from that capacity? And as you guys know, I'm incredibly uh, close and spiritual with God. And so I, I've, I've read and heard so many things that she's also very much in the same line. So I'm kind of very interested and intrigued to find out what that, her relationship with spirituality uh, coincides with with AI. Amazing. Well, before we jump into it, I want to encourage everyone to sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already at nftnow.com. Each week, we simplify all the insanity that's happening in the NFT markets uh, into actionable insights straight to your inbox. But without any further ado, Claire Silver. Claire, welcome to the NFT Now podcast. So happy to have you on. Hey, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me this morning. Well, let's jump into it a bit. I'd love to hear about your introduction to AI art and how you got into NFTs. Yeah, it's kind of a convoluted story and I'm using an avatar and it's new. So my face may do some weird things. Apologies for that. But um, basically, I guess back in 2015, um, I had a chronic illness that changed my life. Um, it sort of ended my prior career and I spent a lot of time on the internet, like a lot of people. Um, and so because of that, I ended up on the boards of 4chan, uh, the art boards of 4chan. And I was really bored um, being at home all the time. And so I decided I would teach myself to oil paint. And so the art boards were a way for me to talk to other artists and figure things out. And um, one day someone rolled in there and was like, hey, you sad sack, since you're just drawing waifus all day, why not try cryptocurrency and maybe change your life? And it was like, okay, well, this is probably predatory, but you know, I'm going to try it anyway. And I fell in love with it and um, started getting involved. And then around the same time, I discovered a television show called Westworld, which you may be familiar with. It's about AI. Um, and it fascinated me because I started thinking about a future without illnesses like mine and what humanity might look like um, without those kind of ancient human evils like sickness. Um, so I started painting about that, and then I was researching AI on the internet, and I discovered this website called GAN Breeder, which is now called Art Breeder, um, which is a very accessible tool a lot of artists use to make AI. So combining the oil paint with the crypto with the AI art <laughs> about those subjects, it all sort of coalesced into this focal point, uh, January 2020, or January 2021, December 2020, um, I started minting my AI and painted work um, on crypto. And that's how I got into NFTs. That and I had the CryptoPunk from 
2016 when I was in a chat room um, talking about crypto and met someone that had just claimed 730 of them that day, and I had just missed claim. And so wow. he said, do you want three? They're about, yeah, they're about 10 cents. Do you <laughs> want three? And I said, sure, I'll hold them till they're in the MoMA. And that turned out to be- That's a hell of a consolation now. prize. <laughs> It sure is. Yeah. And so I held them for years. I still, I, I only sold one, um, but that was Mr. 703 who no longer goes by that Ooh. moniker, but uh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's so awesome. I, I, I love that you are so native to the Web3 ethos and utilizing the tools and the resources from that perspective, right? Um, getting a crypto phone for 10 cents. That, that's pretty wild. That's a great story. But, you know, how let, I'd love to speak to you, um, your ability to build awareness. How did you build awareness and a strong collector base for your work as an AI artist? It was kind of a weird situation because I saw value in the art I was making. I felt like it was beautiful and important, but I didn't think anyone else would. <laughs> and so um, when I started minting, it was kind of this leap of faith. Um, Mr. 703 actually was the first, well, he wasn't my first buyer, but he bought, um, a substantial amount, uh, for his collection because he thought it was beautiful as well. Um, and it was just kind of a slow build. I started minting it, I think 0.07 or 0.08, which at the time was around $150. Um, and I was amazed that anything sold at that level. I didn't think anyone would buy my work. Um, and then after a while, it slowed down and stopped and I stopped making sales and I kind of got down about it. And then it was like, you know what? No, I know this is, you know, important. It's going to be an important movement. I know this is early work. I'm going to raise my prices. And so I delisted everything and relisted a few things at one ETH each. Um, and I got a sale almost right away to someone, Monk, who's a, a, another person in the community, a collector I appreciate. Um, and then after that, it just kind of snowballed. It was, you know, one ETH and then it was five ETH and then it was 15. And then it was, and now I think my last was 52 um, for a one of one. So slow, slow, but not slow. Slow for this space, fast for literally anywhere else kind of build. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, we always say that the NFT space moves that fast. Um, but, you know, it's been really interesting because uh, AI art has been a, a hot topic of conversation over the past few weeks um, with, you know, the, the rise of, of Dolly 2 uh, and Mid Journey, some of these, these tools. They've been all over social media, spawning memes and also legitimate fears around the idea of digital artists being replaced. So should artists be afraid of AI? I don't think so um, at all. I like to compare it to the invention of the camera in that when it was invented, artists thought that they would be completely uh, replaced. Um, that wasn't the case and that isn't the case. Um, it's a tool that you can use. I like to think of AI as a camera for the imagination. So you can um, create work with it strictly AI. You can use it as reference. You can use it as a base and paint on top of it. And some of the most fascinating work is that, that has a mixed media approach that way. As it develops, we're going to have video. We're going to have audio. We're going to have all kinds of options for creatives to integrate it into their workflow as much or as little as they want. Um, I think we're going to have... A movement that values pure AI, so to speak. We're going to have one that values mixed media, and we're going to have one that swings back strictly towards the traditional. Whatever movement you resonate with, there'll be one for you. Um, and, you know, different movements value different things. The impressionists value different things than the realists, uh, and the abstract artists value different things. None of those are not art, and none of those killed the other movements, right? It's just different places for different people. If you value skill, there's one for you. If you value value beauty or expression or movement or, or a message, there's something for you too. I love all that. That phrase, like the camera of the imagination, that just like blew my mind. Like literally, I don't know if you saw me having that my moment. I was just like, boom. Um, <laughs> that's so eloquently stated. Um, you know, how do you view and how do you view and use AI tools like Dolly and Mid Journey as an artist? In the beginning, I was making work just with AI, and I felt that it was perfect on its own. And then I got a little insecure that other people would see that as art, and so I started painting into it to beautiful result, in my opinion. I really loved the mixed media approach, but it was coming from a place of insecurity. Um, and then as I've kind of grown and, and sort of 
worked with it more and more, I'm, I'm kind of back where I started to wanting to just do the prompts. Now I'm using text to text to image AI at this point um, and pushing them as far as they can go. So I'm sort of back to the purist mindset, although I think I'll probably swing back into mixed media again and it'll be back and forth as tools develop. But I've used them as reference. I've painted physical paintings, oil paintings from AI reference. I've used them as textures in 3D, as video for After Effects. Um, and then now I'm, I'm mostly doing just the outputs, both as art and kind of as a visual diary. I've been making dolly outputs for kind of how my day is going as I'm doing things. And that's fun. I have a follow-up question on that for our listeners in, in the community that don't re- that are new to the space, that are entering the space. Can you help us under- uh, define what a purist is uh, from your perspective? That would be really awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're using something like Art Breeder, which is not text, it's visual input and sliders, um, a purist would be someone that doesn't do any post-production to the AI piece that comes out. It's just the output. If you're using text to AI, it's the same thing. It's prompt refining and tweaking until it's exactly what you want, as opposed to um, painting into it afterwards. No, that's super helpful. I think, uh, you know, it's it, always good to, as we're navigating new tech uh, technology, to to remember that uh, things that seem like natural to us may may, may be, uh, be new concepts to others. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm aligned with you. I'm really excited. Like, I think technology has always uh, moved art forward and uh, AI is, is a new f- and exciting frontier there. Um, I'm, I want to get your thoughts too. Like, you know, technology obviously in, can do amazing things in great hands, and it can also, you know, do not so great things in in the hands of bad actors. And I'm curious if you're worried at all about um, the potential for tools that allow for like instantaneous creation of artwork to be misused by those who are just looking to make a quick buck in the NFT space. Like, for example, like could Dali be the next Fiverr in terms of these like rinse and repeat, you know, uh, money motivated like cash grab, grab grab projects in the future? Yeah, I think we'll go through a stage of that for sure, right? Like when Art Breeder first started gaining popularity, there were a lot of quote unquote low effort sort of mints, um, you know, 10,000 pictures that were just uh, not a lot put into them kind of thing. And initially people that weren't familiar with the technology were vulnerable to that. Um, Although I would argue if they love it, then they love it. But um, as time went on, you know, you became more discerning, you recognized the look and you sort of figured out um, what you found had value and collectors were able to make better choices. I think the same thing will happen with any of these technologies until it becomes totally indistinguishable, at which point I'm not sure it will matter at that point. It'll be more if you love the message or the look. Um, but yeah, there's also the worry of, you know, bad actors in terms of content. Um, so if you can create anything, then you have to worry about people using it for illegal content or malicious, uh, you know, propaganda content or whatever else. Um, OpenAI, which is Dolly's parent company, um, has a very strict, very hands-on approach with that that's been very good for it. There are also um, other tools uh, like Stability AI that are not having that approach. They're very open. They're open source. They're open material. Um, And at that point, it's just a matter of, you know, it's sort of like what you value. Do you value the free speech element or do you value the sort of safety from um, malicious content kind of element? Um, And I guess the marketplace will decide. I'm not sure how it's going to go. I can see pros and cons for both. Yeah, let's speak. let's, Let's speak to those pros and cons a little bit. I'd love to dive deeper on that. You brought up some really interesting topics around ethics and, you know, uh, and around ethics and AI is a very big topic. And I also want to speak to a little bit about around deep fakes in AI. Do you feel that, um, AI and deep fakes are going to kind of create the new forgery of art? Can an AI actually create a, a forged piece of art that may live on chain from that perspective? So deepfakes and and sort of the idea of forgery are a little separate for me Um, when I'm thinking about. So if I go to Dolly and I type in uh, the Mona Lisa, I won't get a picture of the Mona Lisa. I will get what the model imagines the Mona Lisa might look like based on what it understands about what the Mona Lisa is. So you're not going to get an exact replica no matter what you type in. Um, When it comes to deepfakes, it's a scary thing. I'm not going to lie. Like, obviously it's a, it's a 
brave new frontier with a lot of possibility for bad actors. But I think that whenever there's um, an issue like that that comes up with technology, there are also solutions that pop up. We'll just have to become better researchers. So if you have a video and you're not sure if it's real, there are going to be tools you can pop it in and it'll analyze if it's been deep faked or not. I'm sure there are those that already exist, but they'll get better. Um, but yeah, that's definitely, but then on the other side of it, you know, the positive creative side of it, pretty soon you're going to be able to take a model and feed it all of your favorite lyrics, diaries, novels, screenplays, and tell it you would like a screenplay for a film noir, um, starring you exactly to your taste, and it'll spit one out. And then in a couple more years, we'll be able to have a video to go with that and you'll be able to make your own, your own film. So I think it's going to turn everyone into a creator for better or for worse, essentially. Holy shit. You just gave me like the greatest idea i have like over like 10 years <laughs> i have over 10 or 12 years of journals that i've written i actually have like so many journals so like i could probably like oh, amazing feed it to the ai and see if they can uh create my my like memoir or something but i, I love to dive deep. yeah you could use gpt3 yeah that'd be super f- dope on that front i actually want to dive deeper a little bit more on like the misconceptions uh about ai art um what are they and what are some of the things that we can do better to kind of embrace AI and what are those misconceptions that are out there right now? Well, the first one that I hear most often is that you just push a button, that it takes no effort. Um, The same arguments were used against the camera, again, which is why I like to compare it. Also against abstract art, my five-year-old could do that, that kind of thing, right? So, you know, speaking from uh, an effort perspective, for example, this collection that I'm putting out with Mirage Gallery soon, it's 500 pieces. So that's 500 individual text prompts. Um, but really, it's probably more like six or 7,000 because you re-roll so many times to get one picture that you like. Then from there, you can do in-painting, which I'm doing, which means you extend either side of the piece to make it widescreen instead of square, which is another several thousand prompts of tweaking and trying to get it all right. Then you have to stitch it together and post in something like Procreate or Photoshop, make it all cohesive. Then you have to upscale all of it. Then you have to name all of it. So there's like, you know, I've been working probably a cumulative I don't know. It's it's probably been close to a thousand hours since I've started on this. It's been months that I've been working on this for one collection. Um, One piece that I put out you don't see everything that goes behind it, but it's quite a bit. But separate from that work, um, there are also many other processes besides text to image for AI. There's people that train their own models. There's people that do hand painting. There's people that upload their own painted material as a base to start with. You have no idea what goes into it. And then separate from that, even the idea of effort being the measure by which art matters like that the amount of manual labor or hard work that you put in is what makes something art I take issue with. Um, I think that human expression is what I would value um, in art. And so that's more exciting to me. Um, And that's why there are different movements. Like I said, abstract versus realism, what you value is your taste. You know, I had an exhibition of emerging artists in New York a couple of months ago that I, I put on with Accelerate. Um, and the doorman, the guard, basically security guard for the event said, boy, I love all this art, but I can't draw a stick figure, you know? And I said, well, let's do a prompt in Dolly. And so we did one together and it was the most incredible, beautiful piece of art that would have never existed without the artist, without him. Um, and he lit up like a, like a Christmas tree and said, oh my God, I can't wait to show my wife. This is incredible. She's going to love it. And it was this moment where it's like, I'm so interested in what humanity has to say without the barrier of skill, people that have not been able to express themselves creatively in that way. That interests me so much more than what someone that's been through years of art school has to say, not that that's not valuable, but we've already been talking about that for you know generations. I want to know what people that have never been able to express themselves will express when given tools to do so. I absolutely love that. And you know, when I was when I was uh, reading your bio, there was a, a line that really stood out to me when you wrote that uh, with the rise of AI for the first time, the barrier of skill is swept away. Taste is the new skill. And I was like, hmm, that really that, that hit home for me. Um, because, you know, as an example, as an analog, I'm a bite ear musician. 
I cannot play a piano if it's in front of me. I cannot, I'm, I can barely play a few chords on guitar, but I can think in melodies and I know they're in tune. I know they're in the right like keys and all that. I just don't know what the keys are. And it was, you know, a tool like Ableton Live that allowed me to literally do voice to MIDI and allow me to sing into the computer and it to figure out the notes that enabled me to transcend that skill barrier and still allow that that music to get heard. And so this like was like the, you know, this really resonated with me. I'd love to hear your thoughts too in a in a world where taste is the new skill how how does one curate ai art how do you evaluate ai art when you're looking at it from your contemporaries from your own um how like I, I'm, I'm really just curious to hear that process because it, if it's if it's not about skill is it is it just about imagination yeah i would say it's about it's it's a broad question and really quickly before i move on i do want to say jukebox um, is an ai model for music that i don't know if you've experimented with but you can put in things like i would like um music in the style of Trent Reznor, but instrumental, no vocals, mixed with Philip Glass classical in this key kind of thing. And it will do that, um, which is incredible. Amazing. But anyway, I'll check so, that out. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, you know, without the barrier of skill, it's just your, inter- your internal world that you're able to express. And everyone has a rich internal world that they're not able to express in daily life. And so being able to have the chance to do that and to share it with others and to find others that then resonate with that, any artist, any creative knows what that feels like. Um, and it's revolutionary. I think that, yeah, for myself, when I'm collecting AI work, um, it's either the message, it's the overall look, it's the cohesiveness, or it's something that the longer that you spend looking at AI work or working with AI, the more you're able to sort of develop the quote unquote skill of taste um, to be able to know what's behind it, what went into it, what model was used. Um, all of those can play into it. But I think in general, it will just make concepts. I think it's a conceptual tool. It'll make concept, message, and aesthetic matter more than traditional reproductive skill of, you know, I'm able to paint a photorealistic painting of this, or I'm able to paint something in the cubist style that looks like cubist. It's going to be more about the message and the taste. And recently with this collection, I've been combining So like I'll go into the prompt and I'll say something like romanticism, realism, cubism, um, pop art, super flat art, et cetera. And it'll just combine all of these movements into this cohesive look. And it's entirely new. So I think we're going to have new movements with new taste uh, and new people to enjoy them um, specifically from this that are not just a result of the limitations of the model on how the aesthetics look. I I think it's going to be... a lot of new worlds that open up for people to dive into. Sorry if that was convoluted. I was trying to keep track and also not blink just my left eye. On the avatar. <laughs> we love to see it. We love to see it. And look, I think like it's not convoluted. I think that that's more contextual. And I think it's really important to highlight those differences. And I really love what you're saying about taste and skill and like curation. And coming back to what you were saying around like AI being the camera for human imagination, that that's really mind blowing from that uh, with that context in place, do you foresee um, AI art reaching a greater mainstream understanding and acceptance? Oh, 100%. You know, you can see it with, uh, it was called Dolly Mini, now called Crayon. Um, but that was sort of like a low res Dolly copy that allowed people to make memes. So you would see like Elon Musk on a trail cam at 3 a.m. or whatever. People would do things like that, um, which are hilarious. But so, That's, I think memes and humor is how people will come to understand it in the mainstream initially. Um, And then as time goes on, more and more artists will begin using it in their process. Probably artists that use it as a step in the process of mixed media will gain acceptance first. Um, And then as time goes on, people will learn to appreciate the AI art um, as a quote unquote purist. It's just going to take them diving in and getting their hands dirty. Um, But it's, you know, access to the entire visual library of human imagination. Who's not going to do that as time goes on? So do you see, so what I'm hearing from you for that aspect is like, you're seeing, seeing AI and these tools like Dolly more as like potentially as stencils that people can learn just like kind of like uh, almost kind of like stencils that people can take on as a first step and then evolve from there. I think that's what people will value first is what I'm saying. I think that the first, uh, 
sort of mainstream acceptance of AI art will be as a step in a, a larger artistic process. Um, but then as time goes on, I do think that they will learn to appreciate AI art for what it is uh, by itself. But that'll take some time because right now the conception is there's no effort that goes into it and effort is what art is. I also, just as a side note, hope that as AI becomes more ubiquitous as time goes on, that maybe within a couple of generations, we'll learn to value other things. Um, right now, it seems like what we value is hard work, quote unquote, um, above everything else. And I would like to think that within a couple of generations, it'll help us learn to value story, message, inner beauty, et cetera, um, to a different level than we do at, at this current time. I love that. I love that. And it, it's a really valuable perspective um, and challenges certain assumptions that like, you know, we all have, I think, you know, and, and I, I'm really, really interested to think about that. And I'm really interested to get your perspective too, because you've been involved with this for a long time and, and you've seen the tools evolve. And I think you probably have an understanding of also where these tools are headed and, and, and how that's also going to be able to um, empower artists and also, um, you know, put even more powerful tools into, into the hands and blur the lines between, um, you know, uh, AI reality and, and, and beyond. So I'd just love to hear your thoughts on like, where are we headed in terms of AI art and what excites you most about that future? Yeah, I mean, there are models that are on the verge of coming out right now that will allow um, 3D models to come out. So text to image 3D models that you can then plug into video games, renders, whatever you like. Um, there are video models available now. They're kind of rudimentary. It's mostly interpolation or latent walk sort of stuff. So it's blending one image into another rather than um, making video outright. But there's a tool coming out, I think, from Adobe pretty soon, where if you have two images, um, one of a child with its eyes open and one of a child with its eyes closed, it will create, you know, 30 or 40 steps in between to create seamless video of that child blinking on loop kind of thing. Um, so that's going to evolve. Um, I think, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to be able to have screenplays that become movies. You're going to be able to have 3D outputs fairly quickly and rigged outputs after that. Basically, anything that you can imagine creatively, we're working on a way for AI to, um, to, to, to do that. <laughs> and so um, I think also with AR and VR, um, as those evolve over time, AI is going to play a big part in that. Um, Essentially, you think about the internet, everyone's in their own little bubbles, right? You're in your own little world uh, that's curated for you. That's what AI does as well. You're able to have your inner world and curate it exactly to your taste. And then pretty soon you're going to be able to make media in any format that kind of mirrors and shares that. So then at that point, what differentiates an artist from anyone creating, you know, creative work besides saying we're all artists It'll just be, do you have a world that's compelling enough that other people want to be a part of it? Do you have taste that's more developed than others because it's not something you can buy? You either have to have it or you train it. Um, are you someone that people already are interested in? Like if Mike Shinoda released an NFT or a piece of art, it's like, oh, well, this is by Mike Shinoda. You know, I would love to have that. So that's a digital identity and your uh, work building that up is going to matter as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different avenues that it's going to it's going to go down, but um, it will be a change for sure. And it'll be painful at first for a lot of people, but it's not going to replace artists. Certainly, certainly. And, you know, I've, I've had the experience of of, uh, of working with, with, with Dolly too, playing around in there. Um, one of the first things I made was uh, was a little portrait of Alejandro, like reading a book under a mushroom, you know, just incorporating all his <laughs> favorite things. And it took, you know, like, but it like it took a few iterations to get it right. I found the ones that like honed in on the ones like I was like learning the process. And then it like, you know, it made him really happy. It made him smile. It was something that was really special. And then, you know, I kind of opened it up to like the, the community on Twitter and was having people send me prompts and all that. And it was, it was really inspiring. I used all of my credits in like one day, you know, I'm about to re-up, but it's like, you know, it's like, but at, even just like me dabbling as a newcomer to the space, as someone who's imaginative, but, but is not, you know, an artist per se in a visual, is a, wouldn't consider myself that originally in a visual way. Like I recognize the potential and the power there. And I think it's incredibly inspirational. It, it can be an incredibly powerful tool in the hands of, of people with, with strong imaginations and, and a way to like really, really express that. Um, and so like, you know, the mind, the mind boggles when like you think about it and the, and the possibilities there. So, you know, how would you recommend someone who is feeling that inspiration is playing with those tools for the first time is unlocking a new kind of like creative or like a creative output? How would you recommend they 
enter, for example, like the NFT space as an AI artist and do it in a way that that feels credible, that's seen as credible. I know, I know. For example, like you, you're a you're a, you're an AI collaborative artist. Like you, you, you do a you do work with AI, but you also paint and you put those two things together. Um, not to say that they should do that if that's not their art form, but I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Like, how do you enter this space in a credible way as a newcomer? Yeah. So as far as tools go, I always recommend Artbreeder and ProsePainter.com. Um, Art Breeder being what I started with, very accessible. I only use accessible tools. I don't use any code, um, although I am starting with Google Collab Pro notebook type things, which is, um, but I, I feel like for a tool that does what this does, using accessible options makes sense. Um, Art Breeder and Prose Painter. Prose Painter is one where you can upload your own material and kind of hand paint into it to transform only certain sections, which is more hands-on. Artists might be more familiar with that kind of technique. Um, as for minting and getting involved in the NFT space, there's a very strong, uh, there's actually several very strong AI communities. Um, if you code your own models, there's a community for you. If you use accessible tools, there's a community for you. And also for each platform, Midjourney, Art Breeder, et cetera, there's kind of its own thing. Um, I would say you're going to fall in love with what you make right away. Like the first few things you make, you're going to love them. Don't mint them yet. Work on it, you know, for maybe a week and then see if you evolve um, and what you kind of learn and you'll probably find things that you love more um, and then just begin minting. A lot of AI artists also seem to go to extremes. It's either they mint for almost nothing. Like it's, it's, worthless you know in their mind is the message that i get from when it's like almost nothing is it worth um, nothing? i would encourage let, let, you yeah let's talk about that right? no no yeah, yeah, let's talk about I, that. I don't think it's yeah no i think that it's like any art form artists are sensitive creative people and it's easy to be insecure when you're starting in a new medium and it's easy to think there's no scarcity here and so it's easy to undervalue yourself but the thing is if you've got a c you just have to go to open c right like you've got a c of work and the cream rises to the top like scarcity kind of governs itself when it comes to quality and taste in any medium ai is just a a quickly iteratable uh medium for that to happen in um so i don't think it's worthless at all um i think you should not also value it at you know a hundred thousand tez or you know 25 eth for your first mint um because you love it so much what you should do, in my opinion, and what I've tried to do is you start out by minting at a value that you would feel good about letting go of the work for. If you were selling it in dollars um, at a gallery or at a, an art fair, what would not leave you feeling sick to your stomach and also probably sell? Like That comfortable zone is where you should start at. But then once you start selling work, make sure that you're not selling for less than you've been selling for. Like start your next pieces around the sale of your last piece and it'll cause a gradual momentum with your work um, to, to rise over time. Yeah. I love that advice. I'm going to take that on myself. You know, um, I'm starting to, I'm starting to mint some of my own poetry and, you know, Matt and I were, oh, nice. yeah, Matt and I are both uh, fans of literary NFTs, poetry NFTs. We're both writers in that capacity. And so um, I think that that's really great advice. And it spoke to me as a creator because somebody's like, oh, hey, my poetry may not be worth it. You know, like I'm a poet, but I'm not really an artist. Like I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, like I'm a founder, like that narrative or that story that we tell ourselves is, is really key. And so thank you so much for giving me permission like i think this was really yeah. a, a great piece of advice yeah no 100 percent. and just as a side note too i think that writers in general poets and writers in general with ai are going to be um right at home because the text to image ai prompts like the the more that you can know how to make words work for you the more that you can specialize the visual output to go with it so things like illustrated books or um again films are going to be right up your alley Ooh, I, let, let's talk offline I, 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 there's a few things i want to share with you okay. about this hey, i love, love to chat on what but all right. I think we, we've spoken to really a, a theme that I really want to speak to here. We touched base on like the stories of self-worth and, you know, the human aspect, right? The element, the human element behind AI, right? And um, um, for context, as you know, I'm incredibly spiritual. Like uh, I have an incredibly close relationship with God. And, you know, a lot of the concepts around identity and spirituality are very, you know, have been fundamentally studied you know, over the courses of ages of millennia, right? Like we've, we recognize um, these stories that we tell ourselves are spirituality from that capacity. 
What do you think the role of AI and spirituality will be in the stories and the art that we're minting today? Yeah, that is a tough question, but it is one that I've put some thought towards. Um, I am also religious. I'm Christian. Um, that is not something that's easy to say in an art-heavy, tech-heavy space, but um, it's a big part of my life. Likewise. And so with AI, it was, yeah, yeah. And and so with AI, I was imagining, you know, like, like we value innocence in children, right? We want to protect their innocence. So if a child has access to the entire breadth of human knowledge in their mind via something like a transhumanist concept, what does that child look like? They're not innocent, right? So what do we value in children? If we, you know, if we overcome the hero's journey in terms of suffering, which has been the dominant narrative for all of human history through AI, if we're able to solve these evils, what stories will we tell without that kind of hero's journey of overcoming? And so for me, you know, the spiritual aspect of things, it's like, it's almost like we're trying to get rid of the things that have plagued humanity, the evils that have plagued humanity since forever, since the, you know, the biblical stories of, and so it's, it's almost like a trying to recreate heaven kind of thing through technology, um, as well as create sentience, create life through technology. And there is a hubris in that, and there's a danger in that, but there's also something beautiful about it in that I feel like if we have a creator, um, it makes sense that as his children, we would be trying to imitate. We would be trying to do the same sort of things, create life, create sentience, create beauty, create peace. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we're humans, we're dual nature. We're going to have a lot of evils that come from this. We're going to have a lot of beauty that comes from this. And we're going to have a lot of people that are trying to solve for the problems that arise with this as time goes on. But, um, yeah, and, and and also as a side note on that, I when I was working with AI, I was trying to figure out what separates humans from animals in terms of, um, yeah, what is that that something, right? Because that's what I wanted to try and train into the AI as important. Um, and so I filled up notebooks with, you know, is it will to create? Is it, you know, um, drive to produce or, or to build? And it's like, no, you can see that in ants. You can see that in honeybees. Is it uh, family love? No, you can see that in elephants. You can see that in dolphins, you know. And so what I came up with is uh, if you're standing on a cliff, right, like a seaside cliff over the ocean and you're alone, um, there's no evolutionary benefit to being there. It's dangerous. It's not like a farmable location. It's not good for you to be there. But looking out over the sea and feeling the wind and the cold and the chill, you feel full of something inside that feels alive. It feels like you're part of a greater truth. You're part of a whole, right? Um, and so that to me is, is sort of communing with God. That's my spiritual sort of home is that moment. And that's what I have been trying to recreate with AI, especially with Art Breeder earlier work has been that feeling of connection to the whole. Um, I call it qualia uh, because that is the experience of experiencing. So the taste of eating an apple, you can't put that into words, but you know what it is. Um, or the feeling of being on that cliff, you can't put it into words, but you know what it is. So if you can train an AI to recognize that, even if it doesn't understand it, if it can recognize it when it sees it and knows that it's integral to being part of the human experience, my hope is that it will know that it's important to retain it as we move into a transhumanist future. And I think that's the spiritual component of, uh, of AI for me. That was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> no, that, that was. I, I'm just taken back because it just so eloquently put. Um, the following question is more of an uh, overarching question, so it's like more broad broach, and I think you touch paste on it. But I'd love to get a more more specific response from you on this. What do you think the role of AI will be in human identity? Mm, so you know, I say that um, I'm never going to sell my pink haired punk, my, my, uh, 1629, because that's my digital identity. Like I, I go by a mirror and I don't look like a, a pixelated portrait and it's jarring for me at this point, which is funny. There's going to be whole fields of psychology that open up for entrepreneurial therapists, uh, for that. But, um, I, I say that I'm never going to sell her because 150 years from now, I want her to be trained on my data footprint uh, as an AI and be wandering the metaverse, encouraging artists and creating art um, by herself kind of thing. Um, I think that, 
you know, there's already companies like Alethea AI that are training on the data of, you know, famous historical figures or artists, what's known about them, it's trained into them and you can interact with them. You can even create art with them that's partially in their style and partially in your style and that kind of thing. Um, so identity in a, a very specific sense is going to be influenced by AI, but also, again, when you can create anything exactly to your taste, that will become refined with time and what you share with the world is going to be a very specific to you sort of vision of things, um, which will draw a community to you of people that are like-minded and you'll be able to find a tribe, so to speak, uh, that you wouldn't have been able to find before. When I put out my uh, Braindrops project, um, which was art, art, uh, art breeder based, um, I did a contest where I had a collage of all the pieces together and I made a puzzle that was designed to be only someone with my kind of mind could figure it out and whoever solved it would get the piece. Um, and people were trying and trying and trying. And then one person, her name's Jackie, um, just solved it immediately within like a couple of hours she had it. And, uh, We've, we have a very similar background. We have very similar ideas on things, kind of parallel lives. And she's become a very close friend of mine. So AI was able to let me do that in a way that um, I don't think I would have been able to before. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So digital identity and then finding your tribe, I think, are going to be um, easier because of AI. That's amazing. Uh, and I love the thoughtful thoughtfulness there. You know, it was really interesting when I was first kind of going down the NFT rabbit hole and learning about crypto art. And uh, the crypto art OGs and the like, um, I've always found it very interesting that the first tokens to be minted on Super Rare were by Robbie Barrett, AI generated nudes. And uh, those pieces like always resonated with me as being really significant. And I was curious to, to hear from you, Claire, like, who are the pioneers of AI art that we should be aware of? Like, who are some of those like the like the the, the old masters of a of a new art form uh, yeah. that, that that we should that our listeners should uh, should check out? Yeah, so Robbie Barrett is a huge inspiration, also was not seen as art when it first was, uh, his work was first seen. I think uh, the story was something like he brought a bunch of uh, QR codes to, it was either Christie's or Sotheby's um, auction and was handing them out and most of them got thrown away and that's why they're the lost Robbies, the ones that survived. Um, but so Robbie Barrett, um, Mario Klingman is another pioneer uh, with the Botto Project, uh, Pindar Van Armen created a robot to paint his AI creations physically. So it's like an extra layer of collaboration, which is really amazing. Um, Jenny Passanan is one that I love working primarily on Tezos that does hand painting into art reader pieces to this beautiful, ethereal, spiritual effect. Uh, Gan Brood is another really amazing one. Um, there are others that are not immediately coming to mind. Rafik Anadol, his work. Um, has been shown in the MoMA. He's doing a lot for the movement that way. Um, Ivana Tao has been working with AI and Sophia Crespo. Um, I really adore both of them. Um, and I'm, I'm missing obvious ones that I'm going to regret, but uh, those are the immediate ones that come to mind. There's also a few newer um, to me artists. Um, a loner one is doing sort of like hip hop sort of inspired, like graffiti inspired stuff with AI, but with a Renaissance feel, which is really incredible. Um, Nikita, weird Nikita on Twitter, or Twitter, uh, Nikita weird on Twitter is doing um, beautiful portraits that are kind of like melting impasto paint kind of look with AI. I love that as well. But yeah, again, I'm missing people. But. I have a question for you on that front. Um, do you feel that, you know, we in, in AI, in general AI, we have like the Sam Altman's, you know, the Yang LeCun's of the world and Facebook and leading all that AI charging. But we have organizations like IEEE, you know, making sure that we address certain ethical aspects to this. Do you foresee um, that the art world will create its own version of its own ethics or its organis or oversighting? Um, body to kind of guide us in an ethical way? It's a really gray area right now. And I think what I'm taking from your meaning is in ethics in terms of like um, what the AI is pulling from or plagiarism, copyright concerns, that kind of thing. Um, and if that's what you're referring to. So there are a couple of different thoughts on it. One is, you know, that you only use CCO public domain work 
um, in inputs because legally you're safer that way. Um, and that way it's, there's not ethical issues. It's like collage art or remix art or anything else. Um, but I think there's a real case for transformative use <laughs> when you're thinking about, you know, the human brain, it's gathering influences all the time from artists and TV shows and music and films and everything else. And it's mixing them together and putting something out. And the newer models of AI, like Dolly and like Stability, they're not taking pieces of existing art and collaging them together. They're looking at what the Mona Lisa is, what it knows about the Mona Lisa, and imagining the Mona Lisa from that knowledge base. It's a different sort of thing. So I think there's a real case for transformative use there. Personally, I'm fine if people use my work um, in their AI uh, models. I think that um, a more open system makes for a smarter model that's able to better capture and better express everything humanity has to offer. And I don't think it's taking anything from those artists unless you're specifically typing in, you know, a specific artist name only and then recreating work, even though it's not going to be the same, it will have that signature. But that'll also be obvious to anyone with any kind of knowledge around art history or around those artists. So it's a gray area right now, but I'm in favor of a more open model for sure ethically yeah is there anyone leading the charge right now around art ethics by any, that, that we that our listeners can follow or like any conversations or blogs or like boards or anything along those lines that are having so there's an ai artist called mers mensch that has a digital magazine for ai that's very active and talks about a bunch of these different topics um there's also Gosh, let me think. You know, it, it depends also on sort of what you're interested in. As I said, if you're interested in the ethics of, you know, the model being safe for consumption, um, then OpenAI and Dolly would be a good one to follow their conversations. They have a website um, because they're dedicated to making sure that there's not malicious content and that that's safeguarded. If you're more interested in kind of the open or libertarian sort of view of things, then something like Stability AI would be good because they're more free speech oriented than uh, safe content oriented. So the ethics conversation will differ depending on who you're following. Um, but there are, yeah, there are a few. Um, MERS comes to mind immediately as a good magazine. And then OpenAI and Stability, I would say, are the two sort of discussing these from different vantage points um, otherwise. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for this perspective. I mean, we're going to have to do a part two on, on AI art because there's just, there's just, <laughs> there's just so many questions to fit in, to fit in, in, you know, the, the span of one podcast. Um, but this has been really illuminating and I think you're going to help a lot of people who maybe didn't necessarily have uh, a full grasp for, for what AI art entails. Uh, definitely. Uh, I think we'll emerge from this podcast knowing a bit more or understanding a bit more. Um, I'd love to address, uh, you know, to kind of change topics um, as, you know, a little bit and just also hear a bit from you um, on what it's like navigating the NFT space as an anonymous artist. I know that that is a, that is an experience that that, you know, you're not alone in the space. Obviously, being anonymous is is uh, is uh, is is relatively common thing in, in the crypto space and the NFT space. Um, but there are unique kind of challenges and also opportunities as an artist. So I just love to hear what that experience has been like for you. Yeah. Um, so for me, being anonymous has been a real blessing. Um, I won't get into it too deeply for safety reasons, but I'm dealing with an issue that a lot of people and specifically a lot of women deal with um, around safety. And so because of that, I didn't have any social media. I was very closed off from the world for a number of years. Um, being an anonymous artist in this space has allowed me to speak um, and make friends and have work. And it's just been incredibly liberating um, that way. And it's not just my issue or uh, people that are facing my issue. There are a litany of reasons that someone might choose to be anonymous. Um, people say it makes it easier for you to rug if you're a project and, you know, they want everyone to be fully doxxed. I would say that's your choice uh, in what you invest in, and that's fine. Um, but that your ability to invest does not trump the individual's right to privacy or safety. And so I think being a non is baked into the culture and very important. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed being able to use avatars, even if they're a little glitchy like this. Um, I've enjoyed being able to have people people kind of imagine me to look like whatever they want in their head, right? Like I'm kind of 
more of a concept than a, a defined sort of photographic representation of a person. And I like that. Um, there are challenges, though. You know, you have to sign NDAs for projects or you have to uh, get accredited investor status to be in something. And so that requires some doxing, which is really scary um, every time. I wish that there were more options for being able to be an entity. You know, I've incorporated as an LLC and stuff like that, but there are still um, issues with having your real identity tied to things. Um, but, you know, I like being able to sleep at night, even separate from all of my issues. This space is one that has money. It's one that has, you know, some level of danger uh, involved in it. And so having that extra layer of safety of being able to not have your real identity out there is comforting. And in addition, if you start anonymous, you can always choose to dox. Um, if you start doxed, once once you dox, you can't ever get that back, essentially. So I plan on staying anonymous as long as I can, hopefully forever. Um, the benefits outweigh the drawbacks for me, for sure. You really bring up some excellent points around, you know, privacy, especially in the age of safety, right? And I think we fully agree with you at NFT Now. We believe that privacy is a fundamental human right and like privacy really begins with consent. And so many things have like removed consensual conversation. The, the concept of consent has been removed in the digital space because of the like, you know, identity and signing up for Facebooks and the things of that capacity of social media. So I really appreciate that take. It's really refreshing, you know, and safety is a concern, right? It's not just like, oh, hey, they can track me or, hey, they can put a, um, uh, you know, an advertiser or a cookie. But really, there's some issues around people stalking people, actual physical harm, you know, hyper obsessive compulsive disorders where people don't really know where the boundaries are. You know, so that level of privacy is something that I feel we should speak to more, um, especially um from the side of safety. So thank you for bringing that topic up. Um, outside of this, let's talk about the future. Um, what projects do you have in the works? And like, can we get some alpha here? Like, you know, like, let's... let's, let's... <laughs> Yeah. Well, so projects that I have in the works. Well, right now I'm working on this massive uh, Mirage Gallery collection, the 500 pieces, and it's eating up every inch of time that I have, which is very stressful. I've gotten very little sleep lately, so appreciate you bearing with me there. Um, but that'll be coming out August 3rd, 500 pieces. Um, and the cool thing about it is I'm combining um, like I said, many, many movements in art history together to get new looks. Um, and then I'm also using different models, mid-journey, art breeder, dolly, stability, et cetera, and mixing those looks. Um, so you get something that's, so the idea of the collection is AI art is not art. And then all of the initial traits are like romanticism is not art, abstract art is not art, et cetera. So you end up with this mix of everything, um, which is cool. So it's probably the last big statement I'll make on it because it's exhausting just having to defend that something is art when it's incre incredibly, uh, you know, open to interpretation anyway. But there's that. Um, I'm going to be in a film um, that's coming out next year. I'm a protagonist. Um, it's Dan Sickles' film. Um, I'm new here is what it's called. Your, that. Is that going to be based on your punk identity or is that going to be like your real identity? So some of both. So it's going to be um, kind of my story. Dan's been filming with me interviews and kind of just like I've been sending him diaries and home movies and videos. Um, and he's got an avatar that he's going to uh, rig to it because I've been using motion capture for all of those things. Um, and so it's, it's the story of someone that's kind of navigating the NFT space and I can't get into it too deeply, but I'm not the protagonist, but I'm a protagonist in it. Um, so my story will have a through line. So excited about that. Um, I'm going to be going to Italy for the first time. I've never been to Europe, um, just the UK. And so I'll be in Italy this fall for an exhibition. Um, I will be in Paris at the beginning of the year for um, NFT Paris and have work at the foot of the Eiffel Tower in the Grand Palais. Um, and it's wild because, you know, 18 months ago, it was like, you know, I was living in my little cornfield town with one Wendy's and one Walmart, and that's all that's there. And I've never seen the world. And I, it's, it's incredible what this space has done for me. So 
onwards and upwards, I hope. Absolutely. Well, Claire, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think you're a really important voice for AI art. Um, and, and I think there's, uh, there's a real need for, for education and understanding um, around, this, around this forum. And so um, really, really grateful that you're able to join us today and uh, look forward to continuing to follow you along in your journey because it sounds like there are a lot of exciting things ahead. Thank you so much for having me. And I would love to come back and talk in more depth sometime when I'm uh, a little less exhausted and a little more eloquent. But thank you so much. This is great. Well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, until next time. All right. See you then. Bye-bye. Thank you, Claire. Wow. Well, that was not only a very illuminating conversation as someone who's interested in technology and the future of art, but also inspiring as a creative myself to hear how she articulates uh, AI art and its role within society and the future of creative expression. Uh, I think this is going to be a really valuable episode for for many uh, and perhaps inspire a whole new wave of of AI artists. Alay, what, what stood out to you from the conversation? I think for me, it was so mind blowing, right? It's like that concept of when once you see something, you cannot see it, right? Like when she mentioned like that AI is going to be the camera for human imagination, that was just like genuinely like, boof. It just opened it up and completely contextualized what the role of AI is. Because like similarly, I, I have to be fully transparent here. I'm guilty of thinking that this was going to be an easy thing. Like, oh, everybody, can, somebody can just type whatever it is. It'll be there. But now when she mentioned like, hey, without that creativity, without that imagination that the human has, the, real, the, the AI doesn't really have that much of a power behind it. So that really grounded me on the power that this technology is going to do. And I just love how eloquent she is. She really was able to take very asesteric, very overwhelming topics and uh, and specifics and make it very digestible. You know, uh, as a poet, as you know, we both write poetry and we both have minted NFTs. And one of the challenges for me specifically, it's like, oh, what image do I use? And like, oh, who, what artist can I collaborate with? Or what photo do I need to take when my, my skill and my craft as an artist is words, right? It's not imagery, it's not things. So that immediately opened up a whole can of worms of possibility. So if it opens it up for me, I can only imagine what's going to happen for artists and creators in this space from that perspective. I really appreciated something that she spoke to um, is around the ethics, you know, and it's specifically around good actors and bad actors and seeing this as an element almost as a, as a reflection of the human spirit. Like both in humanity, we have good actors and bad actors. It doesn't make humans any less worthy or bad or good, right? It's just good actors and bad actors. And I thought that that contextualization as well was really powerful. And Matt, you already know this, guys. You guys know, like anytime anyone speaks of spirituality, I, I dive right in. And I just like her, her take on that of how it's going to expand uh, the humanity aspect of the art and just bringing those elements of how powerful AI is actually going to make the human element more valuable. That was really beautiful. Amazing. Well, look. Before you go, uh, we encourage you, you know, to, to always leave us a review uh, at your favorite streaming platform of choice. We love the stars. We love your feedback. And we are thankful to you for tuning in once again to the NFT Now podcast. And we will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>